Stanford University. It's getting real today, so let's talk about uh, a little bit of the overview today. So we'll really get you into the background for classification, and then we'll do some interesting things with updating these word vectors that we so far have learned in an unsupervised way. We'll update them with some real supervision signal, such as sentiment and other things. Then we'll look at the first real model that is actually useful and you might want to use in practice, um, well, other than, of course, the word vectors, but one sort of downstream task, which is window classification. And we'll really also uh, clear up some of the confusion around the cross-entropy error uh, and how it connects with the softmax. And then we'll introduce the famous neural network, our most basic Lego block uh, that we may start to call deep to get to the actual title of this of this class, uh, deep, deep Learning and NLP. And then we'll actually introduce another loss function, the max margin loss, and take our first steps into the direction of backprop. So this lecture will be, I think, very helpful for problem set one. We'll go into a lot of the math uh, that you'll need probably for number two in the problem set. So uh, I hope it'll be, be very useful. And I'm, I'm excited for you, because at the end of this lecture, you'll, you'll feel hopefully a lot better about uh, the magic uh, of deep learning. All right, are there any organizational questions around problem set or programming sessions with the TAs? No, we're all good? Awesome, thanks to the TAs for clearing up everything. Cool, so let's be very careful about our notation today because that is the, one of the main things that a lot of people trip up over as we go through very complex chain rules and so on. So let's start at the beginning and say, all right, we have usually a training data set of some input x and some output y. Uh, x could be, in the simplest case, words in isolation, just a single word vector. It's not something you would usually do in practice, but it'll be easy for us to, to learn that way. So we'll start with that, but then we'll move to context windows today, and then eventually we'll use the same build, basic building blocks that we introduced today uh, for sentences and documents and then complex interactions with everything. Now the output, uh, in the simplest case, is just a single label. You know, is this a positive or negative kind of sentence? Uh, it could be the named entities of certain words in their context. Uh, it can also be other words. So in machine translation, for instance, we might want to output eventually a sequence of other words as RYI, and we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. Uh, and yeah, basically have multi-word sequences as potential outputs. All right, so what's the intuition for classification? In the standard machine learning case, so not yet the deep learning world, uh, we usually just, for something as simple as logistic regression, basically want to define and learn a simple decision boundary where we say everything to the left of this or you know, uh, in one direction is in one class and the other one, uh, all the other things are in the other class. And so in general machine learning, we assume our inputs, the x's, are kind of fixed. They're just set. Uh, and we'll only train the W parameter, which is our softmax, our, our softmax weights. So we compute the probability of Y given an input X uh, with this kind of input. And so one notational uh, comment here is for the whole data set, we often subscript with I. But then when I drop the I, we're just looking at a single example of X and Y. Eventually, we're going to overload uh, the subscript a little bit and look at the indices of certain vectors. So if you get confused, just raise your hand and ask. Uh, I'll try to make it clear which one is which. Now, let's dive into the softmax. Uh, we, we mentioned it before, but we want to really carefully define and rec recall the notation here, because we'll go uh, and take derivatives with respect to all of these parameters. So we can tease apart two steps here for uh, computing this probability of y given x. The first thing is uh, we'll take the yth row of w and multiply that row with x. And so again, this notation here, when we have w y dot, and that means we'll have, we're taking the yth row of this matrix and then we're multiplying it here with x. Now, if we do that multiple times for all c from one to our classes, so let's say this is one, two, three, the fourth row. We multiply each of these, so then we get four numbers here. And these are our unnormalized scores. And then we'll basically pipe this vector through the softmax to compute 
a probability distribution that sums to one. All right, that's our step one. Any questions around that? Because it's just gonna keep on going from here. All right, great. And I get this sometimes in general from uh, previous uh, sort of surveys. It seems to be that like 15% of the class are usually bored when we go through all of these, like all of this, these derivatives. 15% are super overwhelmed. And then the majority of people are like, okay, it's a good speed, I'm learning something, I'm getting it, and you're making progress. So sorry for the 30% uh, for whom this is too slow, too fast. Uh, you can probably just skim through uh, the lecture slides or speed it up if you're watching uh, online, if you're super familiar with taking super complex derivatives. Uh, and if, if it's a little overwhelming, then definitely come to all the office hours. We have an awesome set of TAs um, who will help you. All right, now we, let's look at a single example of an X and a Y that we wanna predict. In general, we want our model to essentially maximize the probability of the correct class. We want it to output the right uh, class at the end by taking the argmax of that output. And maximizing probability is the same as maximizing log probability, it's the same as minimizing the negative of that log probability, and that is often our objective function. So why do we call this the cross entropy error? Well, we can define the cross entropy in the abstract, uh, in, in general, uh, as follows. So let's assume we have the ground truth, or our gold or target probability distribution, we use those three terms interchangeably, uh, basically what the ideal target in our training data set, the Y. Um, and we'll assume that that is one at the right class and zero everywhere else. So if we had, for instance, five classes here and uh, it's the center class, the third class, then this would be one and all the other numbers would be zero. So if we define this as P and our computed probability that our softmax outputs as Q, then we would define here the cross entropy is basically this sum over all the classes. And in our case, P here is this one hot vector that's really only one at one location and zero everywhere else. So all these other terms are basically gone and we end up with just log of Q and that's exactly the log of what our softmax outputs. Right? And then there's some nice connections uh, to kullback leibler divergence and so on and I used to talk about it but we don't have that much time today. So it, you can also, if you're familiar with this in stats, you can see this as trying to minimize the kullback leibler divergence between these two distributions. But really, this is all you need to know for the, the purpose of this class. So this is for one element uh, of your training data set. Now, of course, in general, you have lots of training examples. So we have our overall objective function, we often denote with J, over all our parameters theta, and we basically sum these negative log probabilities of the correct classes that we index here, sub, sub index with yi, uh, and basically we wanna minimize this whole sum. So that's our cross entropy error that we're trying to minimize and we'll take lots of derivatives off in a lot of the next couple of hours. All right, any questions so far? So this is the general ML case where we assume our inputs here are fixed. Yes, it's a single number. So we're not multiplying a vector here. So PC is the probability for that class. So that's one single number. Great question. Yeah. So across entropy, a single number, our main objective that we're trying to minimize, or our error that we're trying to minimize. Now, whenever we write this F uh, subscript y here, we don't want to forget that f is really also a function of x, our inputs. Right? It's sort of an intermediate step and it's very important for us to play around uh, with this notation. So we can also rewrite this as w, y, that, that row times x and we can write out that whole sum. And that can often be helpful as you're trying to take derivatives of one element at a time and to eventually see the bigger picture of the whole uh, matrix notation. All right, so often we'll write F here in terms of this matrix notation. So this is, you know, this is our F, this is our W, and this is our X. So just standard matrix multiplication with a vector. 
All right, now in most of, the, most of the time we'll just talk about this first part of the objective function, but it's a bit of a simplification because in all your real applications you will also have this regularization term here uh, as part of your overall objective function. And in many cases, this theta here, for instance, if it's the W matrix of our standard logistic regression, will essentially just try, this part of the objective function will try to encourage the model to keep all the weights as small as possible and as close as possible to zero. So you can kind of assume, if you want, as a Bayesian, that you kind of have a prior, a Gaussian distributed prior that says, ideally, all these are, are small numbers. Oftentimes, if you don't have this regularization term, your numbers will blow up and it'll start to overfit more and more. And in fact, this kind of plot is something that you will very often see in your projects and even in, in the problem sets. And when I took my very first statistical learning class, the professor said, this is the number one plot to remember. So I don't know if it's that important, but it is very, very important for all our applications. And it's basically a pretty abstract plot. You can think of the x-axis as a variety of different things. For instance, how powerful your model is, how many deep layers you'll have, or how many parameters you have, or how many uh, dimensions each word vector has, or how long you trained a model for. Or, you know, you'll see the same kind of pattern with a lot of different x-axes. And then uh, the y-axis here is essentially your error, or your objective function that you're trying to optimize and minimize. And what you'll often observe is, you know, the more powerful your model gets, the more uh, the better you are on lowering your training error, the better you can fit these xi, yi pairs. But at some point, you'll actually start to overfit, and then your test error, or your validation or development set error, will go up again. And we'll go into a little bit more details uh, on how to avoid all of that uh, throughout this course and in the project advice and so on, but this is a pretty fundamental thing, and uh, just keep in mind that for a lot of the implementations and your projects, you will want this regularization parameter, but really it's the same one for almost all the objective functions, so we're going to chop it and mostly focus on uh, actually fitting our data set. All right, any questions around regularization? So basically, you can uh, think of this uh, in terms of if you really care about one specific number, then you can adjust all your parameters such that it will exactly go to those different points. And if you force it to not do that, it will kind of, you know, be a little smoother and be less likely to fit exactly those points and hence often generalize slightly better. And we'll go through a couple of examples of what this will look like soon. All right. Now, as I mentioned, in general machine learning, we will only optimize the W here, the parameters of our softmax classifier. And hence, our updates and gradients will only be pretty small. So in many cases, we only have you know, a handful of classes, and maybe our word vectors are 100. So if we have three classes and 100-dimensional word vectors we're trying to classify, we'd only have 300 parameters here. Now, in deep learning, we have these amazing word vectors. And we actually will want to learn not just the softmax, but also the word vectors. We can back propagate into them, and we'll talk about how to do that today. Hint, it's going to be taking derivatives. Um, but the problem is when we update word vectors, uh, conceptually, as you're thinking through this, you have to realize this is very, very large. Right? Now all of a sudden have a very large set of parameters, right? Let's say your word vectors are 300 dimensional, you have you know, 10,000 words in your vocabulary, all of a sudden you have an immensely large set of parameters. So on this kind of plot, you're going to be very likely to overfit. And so before we dive into all this optimization, I want you to get a little bit of an intuition of what it means to update word vectors. So let's go through a very simple example where we might want to classify single words. Again, it's not something we'll do very often, but let's say you want to classify single words as positive or negative. And let's say in our training data set, we have the word TV and telly, and let's say, you know, this is movie reviews, and if you say, ah, this movie is better suited for TV, it's not a very positive thing to say about a movie that's just coming out in the movie theaters. And so we would assume that uh, in the beginning, telly, TV, and television are actually all close by in the vector space. We learned you know, something of word-to-vec or glove vectors. 
And we had trained these word vectors on a very, very large corpus, and it learned, oh, all these three words appear often in similar contexts, so they're close by in the vector space. And now we're going to train, but our, our smaller sentiment data set uh, only includes in the training set the XIYIs, TV, and telly, and not television. So now what happens as we train these word vectors? Well, they will start to move around. We project uh, sentiment into them, and so you now might see t telly and TV, it's a British data set, so like to move somewhere else into the vector space, but television actually stays where it was in the beginning. And now when we want to test it, we would actually now misclassify this word because it's never been moved. And so what does that mean? The take home message here will be that if you have only a very small training data set that will allow you, especially with these deep models, to overfit very quickly, you do not want to train your word vectors. You want to keep them fixed, you pre-trained them with nice Glove or word to vec models on a very large corpus, or you just downloaded them from the Glove website, and you want to keep them fixed, because otherwise you will not generalize as well. However, if you have a very large data set, it may be better to train them in the way we're going to describe in the next couple of slides. So an example for where you do that is, for instance, machine translation, where you might have many hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes of training data, and you don't really need to do much with the word vectors other than initialize them randomly and then train them as part of your overall objective. All right, any questions around generalization capabilities of word vectors? All right, it might still be magical of how we're training this, so that's what we're gonna describe now. So we rarely ever really classify single words. Really what we wanna do is classify words in their context. And there are a lot of fun and interesting uh, issues that arise in context. Really, that's where language begins and grammar and, and the connection to meaning and so on. So here are a couple of fun examples of where context is really necessary. So for instance, we have some words that are actually auto-antonyms. So they mean their own opposite. So for instance, to sanction can mean to permit or to punish. And it really depends on the context uh, for you to understand which one is meant, or to seed can mean to place seeds or to remove seeds. So without the context, we wouldn't really understand the meaning of these words. Uh, and in one of the examples that you'll see a lot, which is named entity recognition, let's say we want to find you know, locations or people names, and we want to identify is this a location or not, uh, you may also have things like Paris, which could be Paris and friends, or Paris Hilton. And you might have Paris staying in Paris and you still want to understand uh, which one is which. Uh, or if you want to use deep learning for financial trading and you see Hathaway, you want to make sure that you know, if it's just a positive movie review from Anne Hathaway, you're not all of a sudden buying stocks from Berkshire Hathaway. Right? And so there are a lot of issues that are fun and interesting and complex that arise uh, in context. And so let's now carefully walk through this first useful model, uh, which is window classification. So we'll use as our first motivating example here for class named entity recognition, where we basically want to identify a person or location or organization or none of the above uh, for every single word in a large corpus. And there are lots of different possibilities that exist, but we'll basically look at the following model, which is actually quite a reasonable model and also one that started in 2008. So the first uh, beginning by Colbert and Weston, a great paper, um, to do the first kind of useful state-of-the-art uh, text classification and word classification context. So what we want to do is basically train a softmax classifier uh, by assigning a label to the center word and then concatenating all the words in a window around that word. So let's take, for example, this subphrase here uh, from a longer sentence. We basically want to classify the center word here, which is Paris, in the context of this window, and we'll define the window length as two, two being two words to the left and two words to the right of the current center word that we're trying to classify. All right, so what we'll do is we'll define our new x for this whole window as the concatenation of these five word vectors. And just in general, throughout all this lecture, all my vectors are going to be column vectors. Sadly, in number two of the problem set, they're row vectors, 
Um, sorry for that. Uh, in uh, eventually, all these uh, programming frameworks are actually row-wise first, and so it's more, it's faster in the low-level optimization to use row vectors. But for a lot of the math, it's actually I find it simpler to think of them as column vectors. So we'll be we're very clear in the problem set, but don't get tripped up on that. Um, so basically, we'll define this here as one. 5D dimensional column vector. So we have D dimensional word vectors, we have five of them, and we stack them up in one column. All right, now the simplest window classifier that we could think of is to now just put a softmax on top of this concatenation of five word vectors. And we'll define this, you know, our X here, our inputs, is just the X of the entire window, so this concatenation, and we have the softmax on top of that. And so this is the same notation that we used before. Uh, we're introducing here y hat uh, with, sadly, the subscript y for the correct current class. It's, it's tough. You, you, I went through several iterations. It's tough to have like perfect notation that works through the entire lecture always. Um, but you'll see why soon. Um, so our overall objective here is, again, this whole sum over all these probabilities that we have, or negative log of those. So now the question is, how do we update these word vectors x here? One x is a window, and x is now deep inside the softmax. All right, well, the short answer is we'll take a lot of derivatives. Uh, but the long answer is you're going to have to do that a lot in problem set one and maybe in the midterm. So let's uh, be a little more helpful and actually go through some of the steps and give you some hints. So some of this you'll actually have to do in your problem set. So I'm not going to go through all the details, but I'll give you a couple of hints along the way, uh, and then you can know if you're hitting those, um, and then you'll see if you're on the right track. So step one, always very carefully define your variables, their dimensionality, and everything. So y hat will define as the softmax probability output vector, so the normalized scores or the probabilities for all the different classes that we have. So in our case, we have four. Uh, then we have the target distribution. Again, that will be a one-hot vector where it's all zeros except at the ground truth index of the class Y, where it's one. And we'll define our F, define our F here as F of X, again, which is this matrix multiplication, which is going to be a C-dimensional vector where capital C is the number of classes that we have. All right, so that was tip one. Carefully define all your variables and keep track of the dimensionality. It's very easy when you implement this and you multiply two things, and they have wrong dimensionality, and you can't actually legally multiply them. You know you have a bug. And you can do this also in a lot of your equations. You'd be surprised in the midterm. You're nervous. Uh, but maybe at the end, you have some time. And you could totally grade it by yourself in the first pass by just making sure that all your dimensionalities of your matrix and vector multiplications uh, are correct. All right, the second tip is the chain rule. We've went over this before. But I heard there's a little bit of confusion still in the office hours, so let's define this carefully for a simple example, and then we'll go and give you a couple more hints also for a more complex example. So again, if you have something very simple, such as a function y, which you can uh, define here as f of u, and u can be defined as g of x, as in the whole function y of x can be described as f of g of x, then you would basically multiply dy du times du dx. And so very concretely here, this is sort of high school level, and so, but we'll define it in, properly in, in order to show the chain rule. So here you can basically define u as g of x, which is just the inside in the parentheses here, so x cubed plus 7. You can have y as a function of f of u, where we use you know, 5 times u, just replacing the inside definition here. So it's very simple, just replacing two things. And now we can take the derivative with respect to u, and we can take the derivative with respect to x of u, and then we just multiply those two terms, and we plug in u again. So in that sense, we all know, in theory, the chain rule, but now we're going to have the softmax, and we're going to have lots of you know, matrices and so on, so we have to be very, very careful about our notation. And we also have to be careful about understanding which parameters appear inside what other higher level uh, elements. So f, for instance, was a function of x. So if you're trying to take a derivative with respect to x of this overall softmax, you're going to have to sum over all the different classes inside which x appears. And you'll see here this first application, but not just of fy, 
again, this is the subscript, the yth element of the f vector, which is a function of x. But also, yeah, multiply it then here with this. So uh, when you write this out, another tip that, that can be helpful uh, is for this softmax part of the derivative is to actually think of two cases, one where c equals y, the correct class, and one where it's basically all the other incorrect classes. And as you write this out, uh, you will observe and come up with something like this. So don't just write that as your thing. You have to put in your problem set the steps uh, on how to get there. Uh, but basically, at some point, you'll observe uh, this kind of pattern when you now try to look at all the derivatives with respect to all the elements of f. And now, when you have this, you realize, OK, at the correct class, we're actually subtracting one here. And on the, all the incorrect classes, you will not do anything. Now, the problem is when you implement this, it kind of looks like you know, a bunch of if statements. So if you know, y equals the correct class from my training set, then you know, subtract one. So that's not going to be very efficient. Also, you're going to go insane if you try to actually write down equations for more complex neural network architectures ever. And so instead, what we want to do is always try to vectorize a lot of our notation as well as our implementation. And so what this means here in this case is you can actually observe that, well, this one is exactly one where t, our one hot target distribution, also happens to be one. And so what you're going to want to do is basically describe this as just y hat minus t. So it's the same thing as this. And don't worry if you don't understand how we got there, because that's part of your, your problem set. But you have to, at some point, see this equation while you're taking those derivatives. And now, the very first baby step towards backpropagation is actually to define this term uh, in terms of a simpler single variable, and we'll call this delta. We'll, get good, we'll become good friends with deltas, because they are sort of our error signals. Now, uh, the last couple of tips, uh, tip number six, when you start with this chain rule, uh, you might want to sometimes use explicit sums before uh, and look at all the partial derivatives. And if you do that a couple of times, at some point you see a pattern, and then you can try to think of how to e extrapolate from those patterns of single partial derivatives into vector and matrix notation. So for example, you'll see something like this here in, at some point in your derivation. So the overall derivative with respect to x of our overall objective function for one element, uh, for one element from our training set x and y, is this sum. And it turns out, when you think about this for a while, you take here this row vector, but then you transpose it and it becomes an inner product. Well, if you do that multiple times for all the c's and you want to get, in the end, a whole vector out, it turns out you can actually just rewrite this sum as w transpose times this delta. So this is one error signal here that we got from our softmax, and we multiplied the d transpose of our softmax weights with this. And again, if some of these are not clear and you're confused, write them out in the full sum, and then you'll see that it's really just rewrite of this in vector notation. All right. Now, what is the dimensionality of the window vector gradient? So in the end, we have you know, this derivative uh, of the overall cost here for one element of our training set with respect to x. But x is a window, right? So each, uh, let's say we have a window of five words. And each word is d-dimensional. Now, what should be the dimensionality of this derivative, of this gradient? That's right. It's five times the dimensionality. And that's another really good way, and one of the reasons we make you implement this from scratch. If you have any kind of parameter, and you have a gradient for that parameter, and they're not the same dimensionality, you also know you screwed up, and there's some mistake or bug in either your code or your math. So it's a very simple debugging uh, skill and way to check your own equations. So the final derivative with respect to this window is now this 5D vector, because we had five d-dimensional vectors that we concatenated. Now, of course, the tricky bit is you actually want to update your word vectors and not the whole window, right? The window is just this intermediate step also. So really what you want to do is update and take derivatives uh, with respect to each of the elements of your word vectors. 
And so it turns out, uh, very simply, that can be done by just splitting that error that you got on the gradient overall at the whole window, and that's just basically uh, the concatenation of the derivatives of all the different word vectors. And those you can then use to update your word vectors as you train the whole system. All right, any questions? Is there a mathematical what? Um, is there a mathematical, mathematical notation for the target vector t other than it's just a variable t? I mean, that seems like a fine notation. It's just, you can see this as a probability distribution that is very peaked. That's, that's all. There's, there's nothing else to it. Just a single vector of all zeros except in one location. You can just write that out. You can write that out, yeah. You can always just write out. And that's also something very important. Um, you always want to define everything so that you make sure that the TAs know that you're thinking about the right thing as you're writing out your derivatives. You write out the dimensionality, you define them properly, you can use you know, dot, dot, dot if it's a larger dimensional vector. You can just define T as your target distribution. The question is, uh, do we still have two vectors for each word? Great question. No. Um, we essentially, when we did glove and word to vec and we had these two u's and v's, for all subsequent lectures from now on, we just assume we have the sum of u and v and that's our single vector x for each word. So the question is, does this gradient appear in lots of other windows? And it does. So if you, uh, the answer is yes. So if you have the word in, that vector here uh, and the gradients will appear in all the windows that have the word in inside of them. Uh, and same with museums and so on. And so as you do stochastic gradient descent, you look at one window at a time, you update it, and you go to the next window, you update it, and so on. Great questions. All right. Now let's look at uh, how we update these concatenated word vectors. So basically, as we're training this, if we train it, for instance, with sentiment, we'll push all the positive words in one direction and the other words in another direction. If we train it uh, for uh, named entity recognition, then eventually our model can learn that seeing something like in as the word just before the center word would be indicative uh, for that center word to be a location. So now what's missing for training this full window model? Well, uh, mainly the gradient of J with respect to the softmax weights weights, w. And so we basically will take similar steps. We'll write down all the partial derivatives with respect to wij first and so on. And then we have our full gradient for this entire model. And again, this will be very sparse and you're going to want to have some clever ways of implementing these word vector updates so you don't send a bunch of zeros around at every single window because each window will only have uh, a, few, a few words. So in fact, uh, it's so important for your code in the problem set uh, to think carefully through your matrix implementations that it's worth to spend uh, two or three slides on this. So there are essentially uh, two very expensive operations in the softmax, uh, the matrix multiplication and the exponent. We'll actually later in the lecture find a way to deal with the exponent, uh, but uh, the matrix multiplication can also be implement it much more efficiently. Uh, so you might be tempted in the beginning to think, oh, this is probability for this class and this is the probability for that class and so I'm gonna implement a for loop over all my different classes and then I'll take derivatives or matrix multiplications one row at a time. And that is going to be very, very inefficient. So let's go through some very simple Python code here to show you what I mean. So essentially always looping over these word vectors instead of concatenating everything into one large matrix and then multiplying these is always going to be more efficient. So let's assume we have uh, 500 windows that we want to classify and let's assume each window has a dimensionality of 300. These are reasonable numbers. And let's assume we have five classes in our softmax. And so at some point during the computation, you now have two options. Uh, so W here are weights for the softmax. It's going to be C, many rows, and D, many columns. Uh, 
Now, uh, the word vectors here that are concatenated for each window, we can either have a list of a bunch of separate word vectors, or we can have one large matrix that's going to be d times n. So d many rows and n many windows. So we have 500 windows, so we have 500 columns here in this one matrix. And now, essentially, we can multiply the w here for each vector separately, or we can do this one matrix multiplication, uh, multiplication entirely, and you literally have a 12x uh, speed difference. And sadly, with these larger models, you know, one iteration or something might take a day, eventually, for more complex models, large data sets. So the difference is between literally 12 days or one day of you iterating and you making your deadlines and, and everything. Uh, so it's super important. And now, sometimes people are tripped up by what does it mean to multiply and, uh, and do this here. Essentially, it's the same thing that we've done here for one softmax, but uh, what we did is we actually concatenated a lot of different inputs, input vectors x, and so we'll get a lot of different uh, unnormalized scores out at the end, and then we can tease them apart again for them. So you have here C times a d-dimensional matrix for the d-dimensional input, so using the same notation, yeah, dimensionality of each window, times a d times n matrix, so you'll get a C times n matrix out. So those are all the probabilities here for your n many uh, classes, uh, n many um, training samples. Any questions around that? So it's super important, all your code will be way too slow if you don't do this. And so this is very much a, an implementation trick. Uh, and so in most of the equations, we're not gonna actually go there because that makes everything even more complicated. Uh, we'll, in the equations, look at only a single example at a time. But in the end, you're gonna wanna vectorize all your code. Matrices are your friend. Use them as much as you can. Also, uh, in many cases, especially for this problem set where you really understand the nuts and bolts of how to train and optimize your models, uh, you will come across a lot of different choices. It's like, oh, I could implement it this way or that way. And you can go to ETA and ask, oh, should I implement it this way or that way? But you can also just use TimeIt uh, as your magic uh, Python and just let, you know, make a very informed decision and gain intuition yourself. And just basically, you want to speed test uh, a lot of different options that you have in your code uh, a lot of the time. All right. So this was just a pure softmax. And now, the softmax alone is not very powerful because uh, it really only gives you these linear decision boundaries in your original space. If you have very, very little training data, that could be okay, and you kind of use the not so powerful model almost as an abstract regularizer. But with more data, it's actually quite limiting. So, you know, if we have here a bunch of words and we don't want to update our word vectors, softmax would only give us this linear decision boundary, which is kind of lame. And it would be way better if we could, you know, maybe correctly classify uh, these points here as well. And so basically, this is one of the many motivations for using neural networks because neural networks will give us much more complex decision boundaries and allow us to fit much more complex functions to our training data. And you could be snarky and, think, and actually rename neural networks, which sounds really cool, as just general function approximators. Just wouldn't have quite the same ring to it. Um, but it's essentially what they are. So let's define how we get from the simple logistic regression to a neural network and, and beyond, and deep neural nets. So let's demystify the whole thing by starting and defining again some of the terminology, and then we can have more fun with the math, and then uh, in one and a half lectures from now, we can just basically use all these Lego blocks. So bear with me, this is gonna be tough. Um, uh, try, to, try to concentrate and ask questions um, if, if you have any, because we'll keep building now a pretty awesome uh, larger model that's really useful. So we'll have inputs, uh, we'll have a bias unit, uh, we'll have an activation function and output for each single neuron in our larger neural network. So let's define a single neuron first. 
basically, it's, you can see it as a binary logistic regression unit. Uh, we're going to have inside, again, a set of weights that we have a simple inner product with with our input. So we have the input x here to this neuron. And in the end, we're going to add a bias term, sort of an always on feature, uh, that kind of defines how likely should this neuron fire. And by firing, I mean have a very high probability that's close to one for being on. And f here is always, from now on, going to be this element-wise function, uh, in our case here, the sigmoid, uh, that just squishes whatever this sum gives us, the inner product plus the bias term, and basically squishes it to be between zero and one. All right, so this is the definition of a single neuron. Now, if we feed a vector of inputs through all these different little logistic regression functions and neurons, uh, we get this output. And now, the main difference between just predicting directly a softmax uh, and standard machine learning and deep learning is that we'll actually not force these to give directly the output, but they will themselves be inputs to yet another neuron. And it's the loss function on top of that neuron, such as cross-entropy error, uh, that will now govern what these intermediate uh, hidden neurons, or in the hidden layer, what they will actually try to achieve. And the model can decide itself what it should represent, how it should transform this input inside these hidden units here uh, in order to give us a lower error at the final output. And it's really just this concatenation of these hidden neurons, these little binary logistic regression units that will allow us to build very deep neural network architectures. Now, again, for sanity's sake, we're going to have to use matrix notation because all of these can be very succinctly described uh, in terms of matrix multiplication. So A1 here is going to be the final activation of the first neuron, A2, the second neuron, and so on. So instead of writing out the inner product here, uh, or writing even this as an, inner, uh, as an inner product plus the bias term, we're going to use matrix notation. And it's very important now to pay attention to these intermediate variables that we'll define because we'll see these over and over again as we take uh, as we use the chain rule to take derivatives. So we'll define z here as w times x plus the bias vector. So we'll basically have here as many bias terms, and this, this vector has the same dimensionality as the number of neurons that we have in this layer. And w will have number of rows for the number of neurons that we have times number of columns uh, for the input dimensionality of x. And then we'll, whenever we write A of F of Z, what that means here is that we'll actually apply F element-wise. So F of Z, when Z is a vector, is just F of Z1, F of Z2, and F of Z3. And now you might ask, well, why, why do we have all this added complexity here with, these, uh, with this sigmoid function? Later on, we can actually have other kinds of so-called nonlinearities with this F function. And it turns out that if we don't have the nonlinearities in between, and we would just stack a couple of these linear layers together, it wouldn't add a very powerful function. In fact, it would be continuing to just be a single linear function. And intuitively, as you have more hidden neurons, you can fit more and more complex functions. So this is like a decision boundary in a two-dimensional space. You can think of it also in terms of simple regression. Uh, if you had just a single hidden neuron, you would kind of see here almost an uh, inverted sigmoid. If you have three hidden neurons, you could fit this kind of more complex functions. And with 10 neurons, each neuron can start to essentially overfit and be very, try to be very good at fitting exactly one point. All right. Now let's revisit our single window classifier. And instead of slapping a softmax directly onto the word vectors, we're now going to have an intermediate hidden layer between the word vectors and the output. And that's when we really start to gain uh, an accuracy and expressive power. So let's define uh, a single layer neural network. Uh, we will have our input x. That will be, again, our window, the concatenation of multiple word vectors. We'll define z, and we'll define a as element-wise on the area c and z. And now we can use this 
uh, neural activation vector A uh, as input to our final classification uh, layer. The default that we've had so far was the softmax. But let's not rederive the softmax. We've done it multiple times now. You'll do it again in the problem set and introduce an even simpler one uh, and walk through all the gory details with that simple uh, classifier. And that will be a simple unnormalized score. In this case here, this will essentially be uh, the right mechanism for very simple binary classification problems where you don't even care that much about, you know, this probability is exactly 0 0.8. You really just care, like, is it one, is it in this class, or is it not? And so we'll define the objective function for this new output layer in a second, but let's first understand the feed-forward process. And the we'll feed-forward process is what you will end up using at test time and for each uh, element also in training before you can take derivatives. Always be feed-forward and then backward to take the derivatives. So what we want to do here is, for example, take uh, basically each window and then score it and say if the score is high, we want to train the model such that it would assign high scores to windows where the center word is a named entity location, such as Paris or London or Germany or Stanford or something like that. Now, we will often use, and you'll see in a lot of papers, this kind of uh, graph, so it's good to get used to it. There are various other kinds and we'll try to introduce them slowly throughout the lecture, but this is sort of the most common one. So we'll define bottom-up uh, what each of these layers will do, and then uh, we'll take the derivatives and learn how to optimize it. Now, x window here is the concatenation of all our word vectors. So let's here, and I'll ask you a question in a second, let's try to figure out the dimensionality here of all our parameters so that you're, I know you're, you're with me. So let's say each of our word vectors here is four-dimensional, and we have five of these word vectors in each window that are concatenated. So x is a 20-dimensional vector, and again, we'll define it as column vectors. And then let's say we have, in our first hidden layer, let's say we have eight units here. So we want an eight-unit hidden layer as our uh, intermediate representation, and then our final score is just, again, a simple single number. Now, what's the dimensionality of our W given what I just said? 20 dimensional input, eight hidden units. Twenty rows and eight columns. We have one more chance. <laughs> That's right. Um, so it's going to be eight rows and twenty columns, right? And you can always, whenever you you're unsure. unsure you have something like this, then this will have some n times d, and then you know multiply this, and then this will have you know this will always be uh, d, and so these two always have to be the same, right? So, all right. Now, what's the main intuition behind this extra layer, especially for NLP? Well, that will allow us to learn nonlinear interactions between these different input words, whereas before we could only say, well, if n appears in this location, always increase the probability that the next word is uh, a location. Now we can learn things and patterns like if n is in the second position, increase the probability of this being a location only if museum is also the first vector. So we can learn interactions between these different inputs. And that will eventually make our model more accurate. Great question. So do I have a second W layer? So the second layer here, the score is unnormalized, so it'll just be U. And because we just have a single U, this will just be a single column vector and we'll transpose that to get our inner product to get a single number out for the score. Sorry, yeah, so the question was, do we have a second W vector? So yeah, so that's, that's in some sense our second matrix, but because we only have one hidden neuron in that layer, we only need a single vector. Wonderful. All right, so now let's define the max margin loss. It's actually a super powerful loss function, often is even more robust uh, than the cross entropy error and, and soft max, and is quite powerful and useful. So let's uh, define here uh, two examples. Uh, basically, we want to give a high score uh, 
to Windows, where the center word is a location, and we want to give low scores to corrupt or incorrect uh, windows where the center word is not a named entity location. So museum is technically a location, but it's not a named entity location. And so the idea for this training objective of max margin is to essentially try to make the score of the true windows larger and the ones of the corrupt windows smaller or lower until they're good enough. And we define good enough as being different, uh, different by the value of one. And this one here is a margin. You can often see it as a hyperparameter two and set it to M and try different ones, but in many cases one works fine. So this is continuous and we'll be able to use SGD. So now what's the intuition behind, behind the soft max, uh, sorry, the max margin loss here? If you have, for instance, a very simple data set and you have here a couple of training samples and here you have the other class C, uh, what a standard softmax may give you is a decision boundary that looks like this. It's like, you know, perfectly separates the two. It's a very simple training example. Most standard softmax classifiers will be able to perfectly separate these two classes. And again, this is just for illustration in two dimensions. These are much higher dimensional problems and so on. But a lot of the intuition carries through. So now here we have our decision boundary, and this is the softmax. Now the problem is maybe that was your training data set but your test set actually might include uh, some other ones that are quite similar to the stuff you saw at training, but you know, a little different. And now this kind of decision boundary is not very robust. In contrast to this, what the max margin loss will attempt to do is to try to increase the margin between the closest points uh, of your training data set. So if you have a couple of points here and you have different points here, it will try to maximize the distance between the closest points here uh, and essentially be more robust. So then if at chess time you have some things that are kind of similar but not quite there, you're more likely to also correctly classify them. So it's a, it's a really great loss or objective function. Now in our case here, when we say SC for one corrupt window, uh, in many cases in practice, we're actually going to have a sum over multiple of these. And you can think of this similar to the skip prem model where we sample randomly a couple of corrupt examples. So you really only need for this kind of training a bunch of true examples of this is a location in this context. And then all the other windows where you don't have that as your training data are essentially part of your negative class. All right, any questions around uh, the max margin objective function? We're gonna take a lot of derivatives of it now. That's right, is the corrupt window just a negative class? Yes, that's, that's exactly right. So you can think of any other window that doesn't have as its center location just as the other class. All right, now how do we optimize this? We're going to take very similar steps to what we've done with cross entropy, but now we're, we actually have this hidden layer and we'll take uh, our second to last step towards the full backpropagation algorithm, which we'll cover in the next lecture. So let's assume our cost J here is larger than zero. So what does that mean? Uh, in the very beginning, you will initialize all your parameters here again uh, either randomly or maybe you'll initialize your word vectors to be reasonable, but they're not gonna be quite perfect at learning in this context in the window what is location and what isn't. And so in the beginning, uh, all your scores are likely going to be low because all our parameters U and W and B have been initialized to small random numbers. And uh, so we're unlikely going to be great at distinguishing a window with a correct location in the center versus one that is corrupt. And so uh, basically we will be in this regime. After a while of training, eventually you're gonna get better and better. And then intuitively, if your score here, for instance, of a good window is five uh, and one of a corrupt is just two, then you'll see one minus five plus two is less than zero. So you just basically have zero loss on those elements. 
And that's another great uh, property of this objective function, which is over time, you can start ignoring more and more of your training set because it's good enough. It will assign zero uh, cost as, uh, and zero error to these uh, examples. And so you can start to focus in your objective function only on the things where the model still has trouble to distinguish. All right, so let's in the very beginning assume most of our examples here, will j will be larger than zero for them. And so what we're gonna have to do now is take derivatives with respect to all the parameters of our model. And so what are those? Those are u, w, b, and our word vectors x. So we always start from the top and then we go down because we'll start to reuse different elements and just the simple combination of taking derivatives and reusing variables is going to lead us to backpropagation. So derivative of s with respect to u, well, what was s? s was just u transpose times a, and so we all know that the derivative of that is just a. So that was easy. Uh, first element, first derivative, super straightforward. Now it's important when we take the next derivative uh, to also be aware of all our definitions, how we defined these functions that we're taking derivatives off. So s is basically u transpose a, a was f of z, and z was just wx plus b. Right? It's very important to just keep track. That's like almost 80% of the work. Now, Let's take the derivative, like I said, first the partial of only one element of W to gain intuitions and then we can put it back together and have more complex matrix notation. So we'll observe for Wij that it will actually only appear in the ith activation of our hidden layer. So for example, let's say we have a very simple input with a three dimensional X and we have two hidden units and this one final score u, then we'll observe that if we take a derivative with respect to w23, so the second row and the third column of w, well, that actually only is needed in a2. You can compute a1 without using w23. So what does that mean? That means if we take the derivative uh, of weight wij, we really only need to look at the ith element of the vector a, and hence we don't need to whole look at this whole inner product. So what's the next step? Well, as we're taking derivatives with w, we need to be again aware of where does w appear and all the other parameters are essentially constant. So u here is currently not something we're taking derivative off, so what we can do is just take it out. Just as like a single number, right? We just get it outside, put the derivative inside here. And now we just need to very carefully define uh, our a i, so a subscript i. So that's where w i j appears. Now, a i was this function uh, and we defined it as f of z i. So why don't we just write this carefully out and now this is uh, first application of the chain rule. Uh, we have derivative of a i with respect to z i and then of z i with respect to w i j. So this is single application of the chain rule. At the end, it all looks kind of overwhelming, but each step is very, very clear. And, and each step is simple. We're really writing out all the gory details. So application of the chain rule. Now we're going to define AI. Well, AI was just F of ZI, right? That's F was just an element-wise function on a single number ZI. So we can just rewrite AI with its definition of F of ZI. And we keep this one intact, all right? And now derivative of f, uh, we can just for now assume is f prime. You know, it's just a single number, take a derivative, we'll just define this as f prime for now. It's also just a single number, so no harm done. Now, we'll, we're still in this part here where we basically wanna take the derivative of zi with respect to wij. Well, let's define what zi was. Zi was just here, the w of the ith row times x plus the ith element of b. So let's just replace zi with its definition. Any questions so far? All right, good. So 
or not. I don't know. So we have our f prime, and we have now the derivative uh, with respect to wij of just this inner product here. And we can, again, very carefully write out, well, the inner product is just, you know, these, this row times this column vector, so that's just the sum. And now when we take the derivative with respect to wij, all the other w's are constants, they fall out. And so basically it's only the xk, the only one that actually appears in the sum with wij is xj, and so basically this derivative is just xj. All right, so now we have this whole expression of just taking carefully chain rule, multiplications, definitions of all our terms, and so on. And now, basically, what we're going to want to do is simplify this a little bit because we might want to reuse uh, different parts. And so we can define um, this first term here actually happens to only use subindices i. Right? It doesn't use any other subindex. So we'll just define ui times f prime of zi for all the different i's as delta i. Just for, at first, notational simplicity. And xj is just our local input signal. And one thing that's very helpful for you to do is actually look at also the derivative of uh, the logistic function here, uh, which can be very conveniently computed in terms of the original values. And remember, f of z here, f of, or f of zi of each element, is always just a, a single number. And we've already computed it during forward propagation. So we want to ideally use hidden uh, activation functions that are very fast to compute. And here, we don't need to compute another exponent or anything. We're not going to recompute f of zi because we already did that in the forward propagation step. All right, now we have the partial derivative here with respect to one element of w. But of course, we want to have the whole gradient for the whole matrix. So now the question is with the definitions of this delta i for all the different elements of i of this matrix and xj for all the different elements of the input, what would be a good way of trying to combine all of these different elements to get a single gradient for the whole matrix W if we have two vectors? That's right. So essentially, we can use uh, delta times x transpose, namely the outer product, to get all the combinations of all elements i and all elements j. And so this, you know, again, might seem like a little bit like magic, but if you just think again of the definition of the outer product here, um, and you write it out in terms of all the indices, you'll see, oh, that turns out to be exactly what we would want in one very nice, very simple equation. And so we can kind of think of this delta term actually as the responsibility or the error signal that's now arriving uh, from our overall loss into this layer of W. And that will eventually lead us to flow graphs, and that will eventually lead us to you not having to actually go through all this misery of taking all these derivatives and being able to abstract it away with software packages. But this is really you know, the nuts and bolts of how this works. Yeah. The, yeah, the question is, uh, this outer product will get all the elements of i and j, and that's right. So when we have you know, delta times x transposed, then now we have uh, basically here, um, x is usually this vector. So here we have a, now let's take the right notation. So we want to have derivative with respect to w. w was a two by three-dimensional matrix, for example, two by three. Let's be very careful of our notation. Two by three. So now uh, the derivative of j with respect to our w has to, in the end, also be a two by three matrix, 
And if we have delta times um, x transpose, then that means we'll have to have a two-dimensional delta, which is exactly the dimensions that are coming in the error signal, the dimensions uh, that we have for the number of hidden units that we have, times this is a one-dimensional, uh, basically, row vector, times xt, which is a one times three-dimensional vector that we transpose. And so what does that mean? Well, that's basically multiplying now standard matrix multiplication. You should write that out. All right. So now the last term that we haven't taken derivatives of with respect to yet uh, is our bi. Uh, and you know, it will eventually be very similar. We'll, we're going to go through it. We can pull ui out. Uh, we're going to take f prime, assume that's the same. So now this is our delta i. We'll observe something very similar. These are very similar steps for bi. But in the end, we're going to just end up with this term. And that's just going to be 1. And so the derivative of our bi element here is just delta i. And you know, we can again use all the i elements of delta to have the entire gradient for the update of b. All right, any questions? Excellent. All right. So this is essentially almost backpropagation. Uh, we've so far only taken derivatives and using the chain rule. And uh, personally, when I went through this, this is like, you know, a lot of the magic of deep learning is just becoming a lot clearer, right? We're just taking derivatives, we have an objective function, and then we update, based on our derivatives, all the parameters of these large functions. Now, the main remaining trick is uh, to reuse the derivatives that we've computed for the higher layers and computing the derivatives of the lower layers. And it's very much uh, a, an efficiency trick. You could not use it, and it would just be very, very inefficient to do. But this is really uh, the main insight of, of why we renamed taking derivatives as backpropagation. Um, so what is the last derivatives that we need to take for this model? Well, it's again in terms of our word vectors. So let's go through all of those. Uh, basically, we'll have to take the derivative of the score with respect to every single element of our word vectors, where, again, we concatenated all of them into a single window. And now uh, the problem here is that each, win each word vector actually appears in both of these terms, right? And both hidden units uh, use all of the elements of the input here. So we can't just look at a single element, we'll really have to sum over both of the activation units. In the simple case here, where we just have two hidden units and three-dimensional inputs, keeps it a little simpler and is less notation. So then we basically start with this. Uh, I have to take derivatives with respect to both of the activations. And now we're just going to go through similar kinds of steps, right? We have S. We defined s as just u transpose times our activation. Um, that was just ui. Um, then ai was just f of w and so on. Now, what we'll observe as we're going through all these similar steps again is that we'll actually see the same term here reused from before. It's ui times f prime of zi. Right, so this is exactly the same that we've seen here, f prime of zi. And what that means is we can reuse that same delta. And that's really one of the big insights. Fairly trivial, but very exciting because it makes it a lot faster. But what's still different now is that, of course, we have to take the derivative with respect to each of these, uh, to this inner product here in xj, where we basically dumped uh, the bias term because it's just a constant when we're taking this derivative. And so this one here, again, xj is just an inner product. It's the jth element of this matrix w that's the relevant one for this inner product when we take the derivative. So now we have this sum here. And now comes, again, this tricky bit of trying to simplify the sum into something simpler in terms of matrix uh, products. And again, the reason we're getting towards uh, backpropagation is that we were reusing here these previous uh, error signals and elements of the derivative. Now, the simplest, the first thing we'll observe here as we're doing this sum 
is that sum is actually also a simple inner product where we now take the jth column. So this again, this dot notation, when the dot is after the first index, we take the row. Here we take the column, so it's a column vector. But then, of course, we transpose it, so it's a simple standard inner product for getting us a single number, which is the derivative of this element of the word vectors and the word window. Yes? Great question. So once we have uh, the derivatives for all these different variables, what's the sequence in which we update them? And there is really no sequence. We update them all in parallel. We just take one step in all the elements that we now had a variable in uh, or have seen that parameter in. And the complexity there is in standard machine learning, you'll see in many models, just like standard logistic regression, you see all your parameters like your W in all the examples. And ours is a little more complex because most words you won't see in a specific window. And so you only update the words that you see in that window. And if you assumed all of the other ones, you just have very, very large, uh, quite sparse updates, and that's not very RAM efficient. Great question. All right, so now we have this simple multiplication here, and the sum is just an inner product. OK, so far so simple. We have our d dimensional vector, which we mentioned is two dimensions. We have the sum over two elements, so, so far so good. Now, really, we would like to get the full gradient here with respect to all xj's for j equals 1 to you know, 3 in a simple case, or you know, 5d if we have a five-word five, uh, large window. So now the question is, how do we uh, combine this single element here into a vector that eventually gives us all the different gradients for all the x, i, s, j, from j equals 1 to however long our window is. Does anybody follow along this closely? That's right, w transpose delta. Well done. All right, so basically our final derivative uh, and, and final, final gradient here for uh, our score s with respect to the entire window it's just W transpose times delta. Super simple, very fast to implement. Uh, you can easily think about how to vectorize this again by concatenating multiple deltas from multiple windows and so on. And uh, it can be very efficiently like, implemented and derived. All right, now the error messages delta that arrive at the hidden layer has, of course, the same dimensionality as the hidden layer because we're updating all the windows. And now from the previous slides, we also know that when we update a window, that really means we now cut up that final uh, gradient here into the different chunks for each specific word in that window, and that's how we update our first large neural network. So let's uh, put all of this together again. So our full objective function here was this max. And I started out with saying, let's assume it's larger than zero. So you have this, ident this identity here. Uh, so this is a simple indicator function. If the indication is true, then it's one, and if not, it's zero, and then you can essentially ignore that pair of uh, correct uh, and corrupt windows X and XC, respectively. So our final gradient when we have these kinds of uh, max margin functions is essentially implemented this way, and we can very efficiently um, multiply all of this stuff. All right. So this is just, uh, this is not, not right. This is our, we still have to take the derivative here, but basically this indicator function is the, the main novelty that we haven't seen yet. All right. Yes? Yes? 
Yeah, it's a long question. Uh, the main, the, the gist of the question is, uh, how do we make sure we don't get stuck in local optima? And you kind of answered it a little bit uh, already, which is indeed because of the stochasticity, you keep making updates anyway, and it's very hard to get stuck. In fact, uh, the smaller your, uh, the more stochastic you are, as in the fewer windows you look at each time you want to make an update, the less likely you're getting stuck. If you try to get through all the windows and then make one gigantic update, so it's actually very inefficient and much more likely to get you stuck. Um, and then the other uh, observation that is just slowly coming through some of the theory that uh, we couldn't get into this class um, is that it turns out a lot of the local optima are actually pretty good. And in many cases, not even that far away from what you might think the global optimum would be. Um, also, you'll observe a lot of times, and we'll go through this in, in uh, some of the project advice, in many cases, you can actually perfectly fit with a powerful enough neural network model. You can often perfectly fit your input uh, and your training data set. And you'll actually eventually spend most of your time thinking about how to regularize your models better. And often, that leads to even more stochasticity We'll get through through some of those, but yeah, good question. Yeah, in the end, we just have all these updates, and it's all very simple. All right, so let's summarize. This was a pretty epic lecture. Well done for sticking through it. Uh, congrats again. This was uh, our super useful basic components lecture, and now this window model is actually really the first one that you might observe in practice, and you might actually want to implement in a real life setting. So to recap, we've learned word vector training. We learned how to combine windows. We have the softmax and the cross entropy error, and we went through some of the details there. We have the scores and the max margin loss, and we have the neural network. And it's really these two steps here that you have to combine differently for problem set number one, and especially number two in that. So we just have one more math heavy lecture, and after that, we can have fun and combine all these things together. Thanks.